Good afternoon there, Eddie Chanelosh here. Oh, thank you so much for joining me today on the Ridiculously Human podcast. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad that I only have to say your, your surname once. I mean, it's so crazy. Like, I, I, I've known you for such a long time, but I've never, ever had to pronounce your surname. And just before we started, I was like, hang on, Eddie, how do I pronounce your surname? <laughs> Yeah, I don't think anybody in the UK or wherever I go can pronounce my surname. So it's absolutely fine. Except uh, when you're, you know, when I'm in Hungary. So yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's, all good. That's, when, that's when you give people grief. Hey? <laughs> so, <laughs> so Eddie, we're actually uh, ex-colleagues. Uh, we, we both were working for one of the investment banks back in the day. And um, I've just been really kind of like inspired by you and, and your journey and kind of like your your path out of there. And uh, I just got I'm really excited to to speak to you today and, and talk about that. Uh, we were we were chatting before uh, the podcast uh, or like on WhatsApp and stuff, and I was asking you just for like a, a few sort of um, stories and stuff like that. And it's just amazing how you know somebody for so long, but actually you don't really even know anything about them. And uh, one of the things that you mentioned to me was that when you were eight years old, you had um, a serious uh, operation. And that kind of like impacted yeah. you. And I'd just like to know, like, what was it and um, how did it impact you? Sure. So when I was eight, um, the way it started is that my, I was always like tiny and not in terms of uh, height, but like quite thin. And uh, when I was eight, my belly started to grow. And it was weird because I wasn't eating too much and it was just my belly. So we started to go to, I don't know how many doctors. And eventually they figured that I had a cyst and then it led to an operation. And this is like literally, what was it, 89 in Hungary. So it's not, you know, it wasn't the best place, I guess, to go for operations at that at that time. And in my hometown it was a tiny hometown so we couldn't even actually go there um and we had some friends in a bigger town so my parents took me there so i guess it was the whole being really far away from my family they couldn't really come to visit me every day because it was hours of driving you know so maybe they would come every three days to see me and so yeah after that for quite a while, I think I became like super sensitive um, and I would like literally cry if anybody did, you know, just the tiniest little nasty thing to me. And it's so weird looking back and, you know, even just thinking about it or your question, just thinking about, oh, what happened to me? Because then you kind of erase these memories, but, you know, who I am now and looking back at it like that, it was it was a good learning, you know and to overcome those things and the whole understanding the whole dynamics the dynamics of my family the dynamics of the country and the healthcare system and everything else so yeah shame you kind of... this like little innocent eight-year-old mm. and um yeah i can't even begin to imagine like kind of what what went what was going through your little mind at the time you know like totally like alone and isolated and no one there to support yeah. you really it um those things impact us eh? 100 100 percent. and then because I was so sensitive I started to I guess judge myself because I was you know I felt that I'm I'm weak I'm crying you know everybody else is dealing with stress a little bit better than me and so instead of obviously now I can see that it, it is a big thing and even for an adult going you know for a major operation is is a is a big thing but as a child, I think adults are perfect and anything that happens to you and, you know, around you, if it's not great, you're going to blame yourself. And I did a lot of therapy, you know, uh, with a really cool guy who does NLP and hypnotherapy kind of mixes the two. And like going back to those times in my childhood and like heal and support and empower that little girl to to realize that it's all good. And actually you're going to be ending up super cool <laughs> eventually, you know? So, yeah. There's something really powerful about uh, inner child work. Uh, is that the sort of stuff 100%. that he helped you with? Yes. Um, so I didn't realize it was interesting because 
I always had this, um, my teachers always said to me when I was uh, studying to become a nutritional therapist and functional medicine therapist, they always said, you're not a good therapist if you don't have a therapist. So um, it was like seven years ago when I was, uh, I, I ended up with panic attacks because I had so much stress, like everywhere around me it was like I was 24 7 in stress and I ended up with these panic attacks and I couldn't really do anything uh, obviously you subconsciously program them so getting out of them is tricky I ended up um, with uh, the ambulance call they called the ambulance on me twice and um, then I was like okay I really have to look at my life and do things differently and that's when I started to work with this guy and he did basically he said to me it was so funny uh, he said okay so I'm gonna talk to your subconscious and I was like yeah good luck <laughs> <laughs> I was like sure yeah yeah for sure and uh, it was interesting because he was asking me what kind of negative e emotions I have obviously I had all of them and so he was like let's start with anger and I was like cool so he was asking me like is Eddie angry and I was like saying yeah I was I kept responding and in two seconds, he figured out who I was angry with. I just said the name and I was so shocked. I didn't even think of that person for two years before that. And I think because of the stress levels and the anxiety and the panic attacks, I couldn't cry, I think, for like nine months. And within five minutes, I just started to bawl. And for the rest, the rest of the um, therapy session for 45 45 minutes I was just crying but it was such a you know beautiful healing crying so yeah it's very powerful to to go back and heal those old parts and what is time anyway <laughs> <laughs> yeah wow that's fascinating um so it also sounds like you as a youngster you you actually dealt with a, a fair bit of um depression as well and you you kind of had this maybe a bit of a, a dark phase where you were drawing about death a lot you said and almost writing poetry and stuff about it too yeah that's also interesting thinking back of those times and I had a super nice um, art teacher actually because uh, during those art lessons people yeah, yeah the my classmates were studying you know art history and she just let me express myself and it's it's so funny like if I think back it's like a different person but yeah all I was drawing is death just you know black death and and that was that was pretty much it and I I guess it was that seeking period that we all go, go through I, I didn't understand why why am I here why am I alive what is my life you know how am I contributing with my life and and I guess now I see more of that but at that time I was actually questioning what would happen if I wasn't there? You know, would it be any different? Would would it even be different? And at certain part, yeah, point of my life, I even thought maybe it would be better if I wasn't. So, and and I guess all teenagers go through this. And I wish, you know, like I've been teaching yoga for for um, for a while to uh, art students, actually, uh, 18, 19 year olds. And I was, I was like, oh my God, I wish someone taught me yoga when I was that age, instead of, you know, going out drinking and whatever else we, we were doing at that age. So yeah, it's nice to be that person for others, you know, now, especially youth. I love them. Yeah. They you can, can really resonate. Yeah, you can definitely specifically because you've been there, you know what I mean? Um, mm -hmm. It almost feels like we, we're living at this time in our lives in this parallel universe where like there's this crazy kind of like online digital tracking monitoring world but then at the same time there's this renaissance of like yoga and spirituality and coming together and I mean I can't wait to see how it all plays out and which one ultimately ends up sort of um winning so to speak you know because uh yeah, yeah, it does seem like this bit of this battle going on at the moment in the world. Same here. Like, um, I think it is it is um, uh, Jody Spencer, but a lot of people are saying that this three dimensional reality is is the place of duality. And I guess on one side we can be upset and you know depressed and sad about 
what's going on and and the war and all those things you know innocent people but at at the same time there's always two sides of the coin right and then you know i guess even covid and the last three years um i think you mentioned it as well it created such a renaissance as you're saying and such an awakening in so many more people than before um i know that you know we were connected even before and we were both agreeing on you know health and and how much you know how much you can do with lifestyle for yourself instead of um, conventional medicine and that's why I was studying what I was studying but I think especially the last three years uh, created an even bigger and greater connection between those people who are ready and open to receive you know more of this information and I'm one of them as well yeah and and it's good that you are one of them because I, I feel like the the world needs people like you with the knowledge that you now have to kind of um you know spread that knowledge and and help awaken other people and and it's it's been really interesting like seeing uh, what you've been doing the last few years um with Joe Dispenza and I, and I'm like really looking forward to to tapping into that because he's a he's a mm. guy I've, I've liked for a long time as well and his book um what's it becoming supernatural uh, mm -hmm. is just a just a fantastic fantastic book that uh, definitely opened my eyes uh, a lot too so I, I want to get onto that just now but but you mentioned a little bit about your family there and um, that mm -hmm. you actually had like you know your mom and dad fought quite a lot and you and your siblings mm -hmm. fought quite a lot because effectively you were copying like what your parents were doing um, how did you like how did that sort of come about and then how did you kind of get over that um sort of relationship of fighting with your siblings well I guess it started uh with me moving away um and and to be honest I guess because of the the whole environment I I couldn't wait to to be 18 and just to move away and and first thing that I did is I went to Budapest to to study there at the university and and um and then from then on, seven years later, I moved to London. And when you are not around, you know, all that fighting, then you realize that there is other ways to live as well, I guess. And um, and then, as I said, like even even at 18, I think even though I was drawing death, I the the the, the main question was why? And I think we why are we here? You know, what are we doing here as as all of us? Because I also felt like even thinking about having children, like I always, I always, always felt like if I couldn't tell my child why they exist, then I shouldn't have children. And for a really, really long time, and I don't know if I will or not, but um, for a really long time, I was like, I don't even want children because I couldn't answer this question. <laughs> But um, obviously now I see things really differently and I agree with you. I think we all have a really important role to, to help others and to, to awaken others to their greatness, to their own greatness, you know. Um, but yeah, being away from my, from my family was one, one step. But then what I realized is that in relationships, I was creating something similar. And I had um, two really long relationships and he was quite sad to, or it's a, it's a little bit sad to think back because I guess it's 50-50%. I don't want to take full responsibility for them, but um, I guess because that's how I grew up and that's that was my basic program, which obviously we absorb when we are little. Um, I created, I recreated that in a couple of my longer relationships. And, and then I got bored of both of those as well, because I was like, this is not, this is not what I want. And, um, and then it was about 12 years ago when I actually found Buddhism first. Um, <clears throat> and I, I was practicing, um, that for for quite a while until until I moved on to to the meditations with the with Joe Dispenza but yeah I found Buddhism and Buddhism helped to take responsibility you know for everything that happens in our lives and um 
it just propelled me on this self-development journey and realizing that if you are not fighting back if it's not about you know I'm right you're wrong that kind of situation um if there's no response then there's no argument there's no fight and I don't actually have to feed that anymore I don't have to be right they can be right you know it doesn't matter they cannot change how I think they cannot change who I am so that was um very powerful it's really interesting I think so many people don't even realize the programming that they have that they've sort of maybe got from their parents or maybe some influence in their childhood and they will then act that out again and that's because that's their normal that's their almost their comfortable state even though it's like fighting and like aggressive and whatever that's still for them is like a comfortable state it's because what they used to and it's almost it's like quite difficult to exactly. even get your head around but like that's how that's how people are it is an addiction you're right it is an addiction uh bruce lipton always says that you know when we are born we are born like completely clear like as if you bought a new pc there's not no programs on there and then you know in the first seven years of your life because of your brain waves you're in this First, you're in Delta, so you're pretty much sleeping. But then in Theta, you're in this hypnotic, suggestible state and you're learning and every, everything that happens around you, you're absorbing and that's going to be your program. So if you are not conscious of it and if you are not, you know, starting, yeah, if you don't start to actually look at your life and become conscious of who you are and how you became who you are and how you grew up and what was happening around you, you might just think that life is unfair and it's all happening to you, but we have a choice, you know, we can choose actually. And that's also very, very empowering that realization. Um, And that just because, you know, your family lived in a certain way, you don't have to do the same actually. I think that and um, being happy, sorry, being happy, being joyful is our birthright. And that's, that's our natural state. Yeah, it it totally is. Hey, I mean, I've got a a little daughter now and it's been such a blessing. Yeah, she's so cute. And it's just been such a blessing to be reminded about like, what is life actually about? You know, you mentioned you were, you were, questioning why are we here and all these sort of things and Mm. you know I don't even know if there's an answer to that question to be totally honest with you but I do know that one of the things is is to just to live as uh as as a fun life as you possibly can you know and to to experience I think as many things as you can and to try to leave like a a positive footprint in on the world and and Mm. if you can achieve those kind of things then then I think you you've done well um so yeah i mean she's been a great reminder of uh, the important things in life i can i can tell you that <laughs> i'm sure and presence and being present and yeah and all those things and and learning love and teaching love you know you know what was one of the most amazing parts in this whole journey uh, with my parents especially is um i always thought because i'm doing things differently than maybe my siblings that I'm not good enough because that was also part of the program and you know I'm not married I don't have children I don't have a house and dogs and you know all those things like like society prescribes you should you should have those by a certain age and um, it was funny I always tried to to create this judgment but I was judging myself through them but they were not judging me at all and I and I was trying to make them say that they are upset with me because I don't have this and I don't have that, you know, that kind of stuff. And, uh, and actually my mom said, but you, you taught your whole family how to love. And I think I was just flying back uh, from, from Hungary and I literally cried the whole flight back, back to London. Cause I, I, I felt seen, you know, and, and maybe my family and especially my parents have different choices but they see what I do and they see you know uh why I work on myself and what I do with others 
so that's pretty cool and um I guess it's coming from you know how they grew up and like my my dad was born during the world war and my mom just a few years after so it was pretty tough times especially in Hungary so of course like you cannot even that was their norm survival they 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 grew up in survival like my mom reminded me that you know instead of having comfortable heated houses or flats or whatever um, they were warming up their bed with uh, they put bricks on fire and then that's what they put in their bed when she was tiny so can you imagine you know growing up like that no wonder there's you know the drama and the the stress addiction you know and that's what they were bringing so obviously it's uh, it's hard it would be hard to judge that and I think you can only feel compassion and actually to see how far they have come instead of judging but then to, for them to also see you know what I'm about and what my Buddhist practice was about and what my volunteering is about and what my teaching uh, the the Dr. Joe's work is about it's also really beautiful and super touching you know wow that's a that's having a massive impact eh like just mm. that one line that your mom said you taught us how to love i can only imagine like you yeah. like, like you said you just sat on your plane on the plane crying on the way home mm. yeah wow. yeah, well yeah. Did, 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 so so did like did you have like um it was the, the the i guess the conflict you had with with your parents by the sounds it was like more an internal conflict in a way like the older you are because you thought maybe they were judging you, but actually they weren't. It was just like your own stories in your in your head. And it wasn't. I think it wasn't even. Um, I didn't have an. Uh, I didn't have any anything against my parents except to be around this constant fighting, you know. And they have been together for fifty years, and I guess that's their norm, as you said. And and I'm teaching this. Like people can can become addicted to the life they don't even like or maybe they do because they have been only knowing this life so so they are you know fine with it it's just I wish I could I wish I could um, help them as well you know to to realize that actually well they are changing a little bit but actually it can be so much more fun you know and and the only reason why you're potentially doing the arguments and the fights is because that's how uh, in survival we get energy we get energy from the stress stress hormones and that's it and that is super addictive and just to realize this it was huge for me you know this is one of the key points that we teach teach people in you know in the trainings as well and what dr joe teaches and wow when i when i realized that the reason why i'm potentially fighting or holding grudge or you know all of those negative emotions is because i that's how I'm getting my energy instead of being in a natural state of creation and joy, which actually really recharges your body, right? And the other other side actually makes you sick. I think it was huge because obviously it's not nice to admit that you're addicted to your own stress hormones, but only if you are aware of it can you stop it, right? Mm. Yeah, that's fascinating. Um, it is amazing though, how many people, I don't know, they, they, they love that conflict, you know, and, um, they almost like feed off it and they, they crave it. Um, and, uh, yeah, you just kind of like, you, you wonder, okay, what's this block that you have in you that you kind of don't realize what's going on here. Um, it's very fascinating once you start doing your own work and you start realizing these patterns, you know, and you actually mm. start seeing them more and more. Um, even better is when you see it in yourself and you're like, ah, oh. and then you question it and you're like, oh, wait, why am I behaving like this? There's something, there's something mm -hmm. not quite right here. You know what I mean? And, and it's actually quite difficult sometimes. Like, you know, you, you, you have to be very kind of like reflective and, and honest with yourself and you, exactly. and, and, you, and, and I guess most people or a lot of people don't actually like doing that. They don't really like being honest with themselves and going, ah, oh, this issue is actually because of me. It's not because of the other person. I need to sort myself out first. And um, all of us have that, you know what I mean? But actually most of us don't do yeah. that. 100%. That's, I think that is the red pill that 
you have to choose and um and like my mom for example she she knows what i'm doing she knows what it's about and she told me that i'm too old i i'm i'm i like my ways the way I, you know she, she appreciates what i do she appreciates my own self development but she's like I don't like to dig deep there and I don't want to go there and I just have to respect it's it's her it's her decision right I mean it's imagine um even like you know I guess my life is not as long as hers but if I if I think back wow there's a lot there's a lot to to unlearn there's a lot to you know reprogram there's there's so much work to do i don't think it's it's ever going to be complete it's it's layers within layers isn't it and then i'm not i'm not even going like potentially to past lives etc or or country you know programs and um also the whole world i guess and then what we are absorbing from potentially news etc so there's so much coming our way so you have to be really open to change and you really have to want to change you know to to be able to do that reflective work but without looking at it it's not going to work yeah no 100% yeah. um you know you talk about uh, i guess you know country kind of maybe generational trauma and and these sort of things um i was wondering if you had like any recollection of what it was like growing up uh, during communism because as far as i know i think in 1989 it ended in hungary i mean i think that as well is more it's i think it was more tough on my parents um uh, for for me i i i don't really it was my sister who had to she had to study russian and my mom was a russian teacher but after after 89 she she only she was only willing to teach um, hungarian literature and grammar and she did not want to <laughs> she did not want to teach russian anymore like they were they were quite upset to be honest and you know there was there was a lot of damage that was done in the country um unfortunately while while um while there you know while we were under oppression so so I guess it was tougher for for my parents, and again, that was just you know it's let alone World War. More than seventy five percent of the country was like spread, you know, to to the neighboring countries, but then also, yeah, it was it was pretty tough times for them. And you know, once they left, my my parents were like, okay. We got nothing, nothing to do with with Russian anymore, and um, that changed a little bit because uh, we had a friend who was training uh, volleyball players, um, and some of them came from Russia. And then my mom was teaching those girls, and they were super fun. So, so then she eased a little bit, and I think that was good for her. I was always saying like, "Oh my God, if you became like a translator," because she was really good, and she even uh, lived in um, Russia for a year. She could have made so much money, but she was just not willing to and not open to. I guess it's also that change. She always, it's so funny because I'm like the complete opposite. She always said, you know, only go on the, or don't go on the road less traveled. And I'm like, mom, but I'm I'm going to go on the road that has never been traveled, <laughs> let alone less traveled. So yeah, we are, we are a bit different in that sense as well. Yeah, I think it's good to, to learn from our parents, you know, and, uh, you know, the things that they, that they don't like, maybe the things that we should look into and, and, uh, there's so much mm. we can just learn from, yeah, from our parents and, and, and from each other. And also, you know, what's like so amazing is like, I think people have no idea, uh, what it was like growing up, say for our parents' generation and especially your parents, you know, like by the sounds of it, I mean, exactly we just have no idea how lucky we actually are even though now it might seem mm -hmm. oh, the world's like ending and blah 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 no it's actually it's way more sort of I guess peaceful and in many ways and we have access to so many things and whatnot um that we we that we should be grateful for um but uh that was uh you know that was just a whole nother era of of a very different type exactly. of suffering that's for sure uh so I agree Eddie, and everyone, I know that yeah. um just so it's one thing which is quite funny I think that I know that the 
kind of cartoons that we were watching when we were young. They were the same as you guys were watching in South Africa. So it wasn't like, it wasn't the the US, you know, whatever they were playing there. It took, I think, I don't even know when, when they started to show the, I can't even remember, cartoon network kind of things. But before that, it was a very different, which actually I think it was better. I, I really enjoyed those cartoons, but yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Never just, ending story and that kind of yeah, stuff, you know? Yeah, I think I've seen Never Ending Story like 20 times. <laughs> it's one Me of my too. favorite story, yeah. favorite movies as a kid. Yeah, yeah. But it's interesting that you say that because I've always felt this kind of like connection with um people from Eastern Europe. And I don't know if it's it's not like I mean, South Africa, I guess, as a country was in a way like uh, secluded because of apartheid and that. But you know, the, mm -hmm. the sort of white population wasn't necessarily oppressed at all. But maybe more as a, as a country we were, um, which is, I guess, kind of similar to, to sort of uh, many countries in, in mm -hmm. Eastern Europe. And whenever I've been there, I've like felt this connection with the people, mm -hmm. you know, and um, you kind of, yeah. you can, you can understand, we can almost understand each other. Like it's just this weird I know. Thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And I made it to South Africa this January. I saw I that went, actually. Um, yeah, I was so happy. I, I actually trained uh, NCS there uh, and it was in such a beautiful setting as well. So I still haven't been to Cape Town, but it was Joburg and Drakensberg and it was, oh, it was magical. Yeah. I was looking yesterday. I saw this, this lady's house that I think you might've done it. I'm assuming it's her house. And I was like, wow, that looks amazing. Like, um, it, it, yeah. it's, was that in the Drakensberger house or was that in Joburg? Yeah, no, that was in Drakensberg. So uh, she's got a house and then um, next to her, actually, I think the, the guy and his family, they live there. And then there's another one. So it, it's literally it's three houses next to each other. And we were in, we, we rented out the guy's uh, house because it's huge. And so it was a, it was a big group and uh, oh, the view and everything, it was just so beautiful. And um, we have this um, cool exercise where uh, we talk about, you know, when you when you decide to change, and as we said, you know, there comes all your fears, etc. And uh, Dr. Joe calls that the river of change. And we literally went down. It's not a river, but we went down to the lake, and we kind of went into the water to leave our past selves behind. It was so it's so it was so fun with the whole group. So yeah, it was a really really nice setting. Yeah, yeah. that that's cool. Yeah, well, you'll definitely have to go back, I and mean, I think like visiting Cape Town and the garden routes is like a, is like a must as a tourist. Um, so Eddie, everyone has a coming to London story, right? And it's uh, never necessarily like easy when you, when you first get there, you know, I, I was wondering like, what is your story of coming to London? What is your kind of like a uh, struggle in the beginning? Okay. So um, I was working for a, big American company in Hungary and um, I was training people to do the same job as I was doing but they were earning twice as much as me and I had a I had an American boss and I I was like okay I'm gonna give them a chance um, and I said if they increase my salary by 100 percent I'll stay but if not then I'm gonna move to the UK because my brother was here and um, I got 15%. So on the same day, I handed in my notice. I felt so good. <laughs> and she was so upset with me. And she called me like, you know, ungrateful and all that. And I was like, no, I'm free. <laughs> and uh, and you know what's funny? I I struggled more in Hungary. I, I didn't find myself as much. I, I had very low self-esteem and I moved here. And because I had to find a job in order to, you know, to live here, whereas in Hungary, it was easier and cheaper. I just went for it. And I literally felt like coming home. I'm, I'm sure that I've lived here before. You know, I, I, I just, everything that was a struggle and a challenge in Budapest, it was easy here. I was going to interviews. I think I found, I came on Boxing Day in 2006 and I started working on the 5th of January, five minutes walk from where I was uh, living. Uh, and my first job was a 
headhunter, which is quite funny. But you know, even even the way I even the way that I found that job, and I know that all my Hungarian friends, um, I came from an office, you know, so but they were like, you know, they were waitresses or doing all sorts of things like that. And and I came and landed an office job earning more than anybody, you know, and they were a bit like, who does she think she is kind of thing. But that's, you know, put me in a restaurant to serve people. I'm not going to be that great, but um, I was working in offices and uh, yeah, so it was easier. But when I came, it's so funny because I was working for an IT company and uh, we were actually supporting RBS, uh, the help that we were the help desk for the traders. And uh, I could talk to you about rebooting your PC and, you know, resetting your passwords and all that stuff. But if you ask me what, what I was cooking for dinner, I had I didn't have the vocabulary. <laughs> I could just only no talk ways. about IT. It's so funny. Yeah. So it took me a while, you know, to to get into the rhythm. And also, like, I remember we, we went to get the keys cut with my brother and the guy said something. And I'm like, what language is he, is he speaking? I don't understand. <laughs> and he's like, he's speaking English. And I'm like, what? Like. I literally did not get a word. I don't know, like he, he had a very, very thick accent. So it was really funny. But, you know, 16 years later, it's all good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you actually okay. speak English when you arrived? Yeah, yeah. So I was uh, I was actually supporting the traders in English. Uh, but as I said, like, you know, I didn't have to talk about, you know, what I'm cooking or those kind of things. I was like, laptops pcs resets you know that kind of stuff so it was it was interesting to learn you know like what life is about and and to talk to people about normal stuff not just um it and office language yeah <laughs> i was wondering like at what point in your journey like of like working in office and, and for a bank did you realize okay no, nah, there's more to there's more to life, and there's there's more that I want to do than this. So many times. <laughs> <laughs> so um, when I when I started to work for for RBS, um, within a year I got super sick, and um, that was, I guess, a combination of working in a super stressful environment, eating the rubbish that my colleagues were eating, and I didn't really you know, I wasn't very conscious about it. And then I, I remember I went to a, a, a Chinese uh, medicine guy and he said to me, you have to quit your job. And I was like, uh, you're joking. And he's like, no. And he said, you're so stressed. You have to quit your job. And, um, you know, otherwise you're going to be like you're super sick. And then he told me that he's never stressed. And I was like, you're not even human kind of thing. It was so interesting. You know, now, now I'm like, oh my God, he was so wise. And it's so funny to remember back. Uh, but yeah, I had um, IBS. I, I don't know how many times I got to the point of like complete adrenal burnout. And, uh, and that's when I started to really look into, because my GP said, oh, you have low vitamin D levels, just go outside and run. And I'm like, but I'm running half marathons, you know, I'm, it's not that I'm not, I'm not outside, like something is wrong. And they just said, okay, you just have to live with it. And I'm like, but I don't want to. And I don't believe that it, that's how it should be. So I started to look into, you know, alternative things and natural ways. And, and I think it was uh, at a point where I was reading biochemistry books as my fun a holiday reading when everybody's like why are, why are you not doing a course and become a nutritionist so then I did that and I went to you know functional medicine as well and I saw a lot of people and I helped a lot of people but <laughs> after a while I don't know if you see this as well but people go back to their old habits and their old ways and they add maybe a little spice of um guilt on top of their old you know bad habits especially when they see me and um and only like in uh, when I went to my uh first Joe Dispenza retreat and actually even before in 2020 when I started to listen to his stuff did I understand that without 
changing actually who we are, how we think, how we act, how we feel, we're never going to be able to change those habits. So, um, yeah, that was very powerful. And I'm like, oh, my God, I have to teach that to people instead of first, you know, how to change their lifestyle, you know, habits, because now I understand why they go back. And it's, you know, what we were talking about earlier is that addiction, addiction to the stress hormones, addiction to the to the people, to all the circumstances, the complaining, the suffering. It's very addict and it's very addictive. And I know, because I used to be one of those people. I was I was addicted to my misery. So I know um how it is to like really go deep into the depression and just, you know, swim there and and then blame the world for your own misery. So I think that's when I realized that, oh my God, I have to teach this. I really, it's such, this is, this is the most important thing. And you know, what's crazy that I studied this work. I studied the meditations. I remember it was COVID. You were supposed to be really miserable and upset. And I was so happy. And my friends were like, what are you doing? You're so joyful. And I'm like, well, I'm doing these meditations and I'm studying, you know, uh, the, the neuroscience of change. And they were like, Oh, just share the meditations and I did but I guess you need to understand the, you know the biology and the neuroscience behind it in order for you to have the experience but I was just so joyful and I think I mentioned to you that uh, 2020 was such an amazing powerful um, enlightening uh, year for me I, I loved it even doing um, meditation uh, twice a day for my colleagues and uh, for a year for a whole year I did that um, and I created the first weekend they locked locked us down I created this course on the immune system or just like a an hour talk and I remember I was like can I present this to people I, I was like asking like is it possible because I think maybe people are ready for some different information and I'm not joking, 500 people showed up on my Zoom and I was like, oh my God, like, <laughs> wow. that's crazy, you know, because people need, people wanted to, you know, to, I guess they were seeking, you know, some, some solutions. So that was great. And then I could do a series of nutrition talks for them from stress to burnout to, you know, all sorts of things, digestion. Yeah. So I, that was that was amazing. Uh, I was doing that on top of my work, but I really, really enjoyed it. Yeah, so I don't even know what you asked <laughs> and how I got here, but no, yeah. No, it was just talking about like, you know, when you um, uh, when you basically knew that it was time to kind of like change oh, yeah. um, from, yeah, from yeah, banking yeah. and stuff. So I actually quit uh, my job, how, I don't know, before. And I decided that I'm going to be this super successful nutritionist. And I threw a big uh, organic, organic uh, uh, party to my ex-colleagues. And you could only drink organic wine and organic red wine and organic uh, white wine. And, you know, my friend in her Italian cafe made all the foods. And that was my leaving party. And then it was so funny because... I guess we finished around 10 and uh, my colleagues just moved over to Dirty Dicks. And I'm like, oh, I just wasted a lot of money on the organic wine. Like, you know, it was quite funny. But um, I was doing that for a year and um, it didn't quite work out. And uh, I rented an office and I was going to my office and I had, you know, I had some some clients, but it wasn't quite what I was planning and um, so basically I had to go back to banking but even the fact that I could just go back and to prove myself that that I could go back and they would take me back and it wasn't even someone taking me back who knew me it was actually a person that didn't know me at all and my thing was that on Fridays I'm doing nutrition so if I work I'm only going to work four days and they took me back. I was a contractor. So I was quite happy like that. And then I used all my 
time, I guess, all those Fridays, either to see clients or to go on yoga retreats or, you know, nature or somewhere nice. So, yeah, I think that has never changed. Uh, it's so, uh, yeah, my friends always, the first question is, where in the world are you? <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, and then they wait. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, that's really cool. Like it's, it's, you know, there's parts of that that are like, um, intriguing and, and very inspiring as well. You know, the, the fact that, um, you prepared to just kind of like go, it's like, okay, I'm going to really give this a go. I think not many people actually do that. You know, so many people talk about it. They're like, oh no, I hate this mm -hmm. and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that and blah, blah. And then they never do it, you know, and they just, they, they never will do it. But a lot of people, um, but you did it, yeah. you tried it and it didn't work. And then you're like, ah, oh, okay, well, I'm just going to go back. Like that's, that's a really cool thing to do. You know, you kind of take your ego, you put it in the pocket and you go, Mm. this doesn't really matter you know this is actually part of my my learning experience and i'm sure you learned more from that experience than you maybe even did from from leaving and uh then it 100%. kind of and then it sets you up for the maybe the next time that you that you leave and you're like now nah, i'm yeah. gonna do it properly and that happened uh, um that happened in 2021 because <laughs> uh that was yeah that was i guess 2020 and the COVID year was like the preparation for all this, but um, my contract was ending in February and um, I did the Joe Dispenza retreat. And I mean, if you go all in on those retreats, like I remember the day before I I, I was traveling, I, I couldn't stop crying. And I was talking to one of my super good friends. He's my yoga teacher as well. And he was just saying, like, you're crying because you're never going to be the same again. And little did I know that I packed for two weeks and I'm only going to be back in London 128 days later to get rid of my flat, to get rid of my whole life here. You know, it was literally like I was giving oh coffee machine, this friend, you know, I was giving all my stuff to people because I realized that I spent 128 days in Mexico with a suitcase that I packed for two weeks and I did not miss a thing from my flat because as, as you were, as we started this conversation, I was in nature, I was on the beach, it was sunny, it was beautiful. I was with friends, you know, I had clothes. So what, what else do you need? I don't know, like nice food and my practices, you know, Marissa and, it was and so magical. Marissa and uh, my stuff is still in storage. Uh, we left London in 2019 and we were going to go wow. live in, in Portugal. And, um, you know, the, the following year after traveling the world for like seven months and our stuff is still in storage. And <laughs> I don't even know what's in, I mean, I do. Like, I was going to say, do you know, do you know what's in there? <laughs> you know, it's going to be like Christmas when we get back, we're going to be like, oh, or as long as it's not all eaten by moths or something like that, you know, but it's right. like, oh yeah, cool. I've got got these things and these things and like you know what i mean but at the end of the day it's like i said it's just stuff and it's um i mean a lot of stuff that you accumulate um actually just kind of holds you back i feel and mm. uh it's good to just sort of try and get rid of a lot of things in your life you know um to just create space for other things and, and getting rid of stuff is is a great great way to do that uh before yeah. we before we talk more about uh joe dispenza because i think there's there's so much value in in that and and, and what you're teaching people now. I just wanted to ask a little bit about uh, your your Buddhist journey. Like that, that I remember meeting you once actually, I think um was before I was leaving London. Um and you were telling me a bit mm -hmm. about your like um chanting and stuff like that that you do in the mornings. And yeah, you know, maybe you can just talk a little bit about that. How was that whole experience for you? Sure. It was uh very powerful. I think I'm I'm realizing that you know there are so many ways that you know if you if you embrace something uh, and you go on this journey of self discovery there are many many paths right and I think my Buddhist practice was one of those and um, I started it at a time when I again in, you know it was a time when I didn't really see the light and I, and I knew I knew my friend who was also practicing and she's still practicing. She's amazing. Uh, that she also has her own challenges, but somehow 
she sees them with so much wisdom and I was like dude teach me this thing because I, I I'm like I ran out of resources and um, it was so funny like she she taught me the chanting and I think normally people when they start this Buddhist chanting they do 10 minutes a day I was doing two hours a day I was driving my probably my flatmate crazy at the time but I, I was just like all I knew and now I understand it you know if I look back why it was so powerful and why I could create all the things that I created from that because all I knew is that I can have a better life and I can create it for myself and I think that's one of the most amazing benefits of this Buddhist practice as well is that you realize that you know no external forces will create or give you the, the results but you've got it inside of you and I, I I know that even as a little kid I wanted I wanted to go to church because I was seeking you know but then I also realized that God doesn't help me and maybe there's that inner God that's helping me because when I was in big trouble I could somehow you know save myself or sort things out and and I guess this um, my Buddhist practice was really helping at that time and especially you know it was eight years that I was practicing it it was a it was a long time it was really keeping me accountable for my behaviors my thoughts my creations and uh, very soon after I was chanting, I, I really wanted to leave RBS and um, and I wanted to finish my nutrition course, which I actually stopped uh, for six months. And I think within two weeks, I got two offers uh, from a different bank. And, um, and it just worked out amazingly. And I ended up going on a awesome trip to Goa with my friend before I even had time to do that I finished my nutrition course so you know my and I started to see that actually me as a human being I have an impact on people and I can inspire people and the more you know the more I was able to become a master of my life the more I was inspiring others and then I was even um, leading little groups uh local groups um in the buddhist practice so it was a fun journey and we organized a lot of events and i think it was nice also to to you know create community and feel like belonging but in a way it's funny as well because you yeah it's funny to be a banker buddhist and it's funny to be a a banker who does yoga and then it's funny to be a yoga who's a banker. Do, do you know what I mean? So it's I, I never quite fit, and that's okay. I think I'm. I also learned to understand that I don't have to, you know, and it's cool actually not to. Um, and it's okay to be just authentic and do the things that serve me. And um, the reason why I stopped Buddhism is well, um, actually during COVID, um, I. I fell out of love with the, the organization because um, because I'm huge on health sovereignty. And when they were indicating what you should and shouldn't be doing in order to meet you know, each other again in a later phase, and that was coming from one of the leaders of the organization, I was like, I'm out of here. And, um, and I guess that was maybe part of my education during COVID as well that fortunately unfortunately I don't know but knowing is fortunate or, organized religion in many cases has a an agenda and it might not necessarily be your you know growth only but there might be other reasons behind it so in, interestingly that's when I actually uh watched uh, an astrology report about 21 and the astrologer was talking about um how this new type of prayer when you're grateful for what you're praying as if it already happened and the master of that is dr joe dispenza and she was recommending becoming supernatural and it was um with one of my hungarian friends uh we were we were listening to this uh basically uh, astrology report and she ordered the book in Hungarian and I ordered it in English. And 
I started to read it and I'm like, oh my God, it makes so much sense. Oh my God, it makes so much sense. And there are a few meditations he recommends uh, in the book. And I immediately got hooked and I, I literally was doing like five meditations a day. I mean, what do you do in October in London when it's locked down? <laughs> you know what I mean? So, and that's when, that's when I was saying to you, like, people were like, why are you so happy? And I'm like, I don't know, but I just feel so happy. Like, I know I have zero reason to be happy, but I am. And um, that was the side effect, you know, of all the, all the meditations and learning about us human beings and how we create our reality and then understanding as well I think that was the biggest because I always recommended meditation to people but that nobody told me or taught me before that I can create a life in my meditation and that was super mystical and cool for me at the same time so I was like I really want to do this yeah and I, I, I haven't missed a day a bit further well, yeah, because uh, basically what Dr. Joe teaches is that, as we were saying, you know, when you're meditating, you're you're uh, slowing your brain waves down. So you're in different brainwave states. And now when we are conscious and awake, it's beta. But if you slow it down a little bit, the imaginary state is alpha. And that's a very creative state. But in order for you to rewrite, you know, the program and to get beyond the analytical mind and go into the operating system where where those programs are that we were talking about the childhood ones or you know whatever else we absorbed and we want to change and we are conscious of in order for us to change those we have to be in in the operating system so and in order for that we have to slow our brain waves down to theta because that's the suggestive uh, um, hypnotic state so when you're in theta, then you can, whatever you're thinking and creating and getting rid of there, it's basically going to be your new program. And you can create your new life just by practicing who you want to be in your meditation. And that's all, I think all of his meditations about are about this. So they are super powerful. Is it a type of like manifestation in a way? I mean, I don't know. You can call it manifestation, I guess, but um, you can generate, manifest, create anything you want from health to wealth to just your ideal self. You know, you can decide who you want to be, who who you no longer want to be. And um, that's that's kind of his work. Yeah. It almost sounds like it's like gamifying uh, meditation but like in a cool way because you you now become yeah. interested in it you're like okay cool I'm gonna meditate here and I'm gonna go back go into that sort of almost alter ego and be I don't know Gareth the surfer for example you know what I mean and and yeah. carry on with that story of my life yeah you can create yeah basically you can create anything and I think it yeah wouldn't people be more interested in meditating if they all knew that you can create your life in your meditation. I was recommending meditation to my clients because I, I knew that everybody's stressed and you know stress is kind of the, the cause of almost all illnesses in a way. And so I just wanted them to be more parasympathetic, you know, or at least go towards a little bit more parasympathetic nervous system dominance instead of being always in fight or flight. But um, I think, this is like modern science based mysticism in a way, because we, we are creating always, even if we are unconscious of it with our thoughts, with our actions, with our feelings. So wouldn't it be more fun if we learned how to focus and then create, you know, what we want to create. And that's, you know, that's his work. He he explains everything with neuroscience. He he teaches about the brain waves and you know, they have done so many studies on the brain waves that, you know, people who attended events and meditations uh, went through. So even the way he does and creates his meditations, um, 
it's based on the science and how people react to certain words and when to say them, the music, all of them, you know. And he always says that in order for us to be able to create or be in this creative state, we have to understand the what and the why, and then the how becomes easier. Mm -hmm. And if people don't understand the what and the why, then it's going to be really difficult to convince them to do something. So setting people up with sound, you know, science and biology and neuroscience and explain to them how they created who they are now. And then using the same biology for us to create who we do want to be is so powerful. And when you understand it, it becomes easy or easier at least, you know, but the game is, and, and I, I do, I do like to call it as a game. And, and, and with many clients, I actually say to them, like, if it's hard to stop those, you know, stressful thoughts or whatever, like, I like to make it a game. Like, how long can I go without getting like wound up by someone who's really normally annoying me and those kind of things. And, and then it becomes fun, you know, instead of like, I know I shouldn't react, but I'm going to react anyway, kind of thing. It's so much more powerful to, to play that. Okay. I think my old self right now would be super angry, but how cool is it not to react and actually see you as my old self, because I used to do this as well. And the reason why I used to do that is because I was in so much stress that that was my only way to express myself. And, um, you know, I mentioned to you one of my friends who we have these super deep chats with, and we always get to the same conclusion that whether it's um, a really rough, you know, reaction from someone or a nice one, everybody always does everything for one thing. And that's they want love. We all just want love. We want to give love and receive love. And we might be lacking love. And that's why we are so, you know, frustrated, angry, all those other, you know, negative emotions, or we might be full of it. And that's also showing through, but it's all about love at the end of the day, isn't it? Or to me, it is. <laughs> no, I agree. I think people don't even realize that that's kind of maybe what they want. They, they're triggered by a situation and then they react like, you know, in this sort of heated moment uh maybe not in the right way but their intention is because they want attention and yes um, and what is attention right yeah love exactly um mm. so no it's, it's fascinating and i think he actually uh, what i really like about uh joe dispenza is that he he sort of brings these two worlds together you know he brings the the sort of um I don't want to say hippie, but like, you know, the, the sort of meditation kind of Eastern philosophy mm -hmm. kind of uh, way mm -hmm. of doing things to the, uh, with, with, he brings it together with sort of the actual neuroscience of it and, um, joins those two worlds together and, and, yeah. and, and also explains it in a easy to understand, understand way. And, and especially in his book, he uses lots of cool stories of like, you know, people that, um, that he helped and that went through it. And, um, that mm -hmm. really helps to kind of like make you believe in, in, I guess what he's doing is, is through that storytelling and, and seeing the results that people got, including himself, of course. Um, yeah. one of the really cool things about, uh, Joe Dispenza and, and, and I guess what he does is the, the group meditations. And I, mm -hmm. I noticed that you were part of this like massive one recently of like 8,000 people. I mean, it must be pretty like energetic uh being part mm. of a group like that that was yeah that was super powerful so um he did the progressive retreat in basel and yeah it was 8100 people and i was actually um lucky and honored enough to to be one of the meditation of observers so uh, we support people and we watch people so that they are safe and um you know it's it's very nice um to to be there in that in that status but to actually watch 
8,100 people tuning into their hearts and, you know, really being super sincere and genuine and honest and wanting to transform and change so much. It was, it was, I, I, I don't think there are words to express that. Like it felt like walking around in that hall, um, it was like watching 8,100 angels because when people meditate, they, there's no, there's no ego, you know, they, they, they are so innocent. It's just, you see the, the purity and, and the beauty in every single human being, their eyes are closed and they just go within and they go within. And like, he, he also said, like, where do you see in the world 8,100 people so happy or 8,100 people, you know, tuning into the same thing and that same thing being love. But um, he did something even more amazing uh, on the 23rd of September. And that maybe wasn't in one space, but um, he, in the retreats, he teaches people four types of meditation. And one of them is uh, walking meditation. And if you, if you want to, it's still available on his website online for free. He created a walking meditation and he called it Walk for the World. And you're literally walking and changing and transforming for the world and I think on that day um, there were I can't even remember how many countries but I know that there were more than 140,000 people doing that same meditation at the same time in the world and I think there was a there was a report shown about the Schumann resonance like how it changed uh, at that time because and it just shows how powerful we all are when we all want the same thing. And when we move from survival and fear into something greater. And what I find is that when we, when we do things for others, there's even more, you know, inspiration and motivation and power in us because we know that it's not just for ourselves. And I, I, I remember the first time I listened to that meditation, like I had goosebumps all over me because just just the, the knowing that there are another 140,000 people doing it at the same time, it just gave me such energy. It's so beautiful. And so he's done it again on the 11th of November and he's gonna, I think he wants to to keep doing that as well and keep creating like this movement for the the walking meditation is all about walking with your eyes, practicing walking with your eyes open as your future self, you know? So it's, it's pretty cool as well. Yeah, no, that's really cool. One thing that you said there that was interesting is like the kind of lack of self-belief that I think many people carry with them. And mm -hmm. I don't know, I always look at people and I'm like, wow, you have so much potential, you know, if mm -hmm. only you kind of sort of realize that and, and sort of, um, uh, reach that, not, re you know, like dug into that potential. And, um, we could all like, we could be living such an, such amazing lives if we, if we yeah. sort of built up that self-belief. Yeah, so true. I agree. And, and I think that's why being in community and connecting with others and doing things together with others and, you know, having these conversations is so important because, because then you realize you're not alone and there are so many so many other people who who are also keen on creating a different world you know a world that is about love and where we can teach love to our you know children and where, where it's not about um conditioning people to live in a certain way so that they can serve certain agendas so um yeah there's there's I, that's why i think i think human beings want want to support help be with other human beings we are we are we are we are wired like that we are not wired for separation so all the you know different ways that we are we are being separated i guess that also creates this tension and this unexplainable um yeah it is a tension in ourselves isn't it that we don't understand and maybe that was you know what i didn't understand when when i was 18 and now i guess going towards um 
connection and understanding oneness and, and understanding oneness in both in meditation but also being part of movements like this can be so empowering for 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 a human being it feels like yeah society has been sort of fractioned and filtered more and more and more over the years you know like it was gender then it was race and then it's like like now more genders and it's like yeah pronouns and it's like all these things you're you're pro this and i'm pro that and and it's like they kind of like slowly and politics slow- and oh, yeah. religion and all of those things yeah exactly and it's kind of like slowly sort of breaking us down into these smaller little tribes and communities that are effectively against each other and it's not until you actually realize that like what's going on that you go hang on no no this is not the way it's meant to be you know what i mean like it actually doesn't matter like some of the the differences we might have um, because that's actually just part of being human. But the problem is is they've made these small issues like huge issues and sort of pitted us against each other. And that's why I think there's, there's so much like um, aggression and, and um, uh, division and everything in the world um, right now. And it's going to take people, I guess, like yourself to kind of wake people up to go, hang on a second. No, actually, we need to understand what's going on. Um, we are actually stronger together. Uh, let's find our, our communities. Let's change together, and um, mm. let's make this this a better place. Hundred percent. Um, I'm so yeah. I so agree. It's it's so hard to. I think once you once you see what's behind it, it's it's hard to accept separation. And I guess you know. Um, that's why I find it funny. I mean, human beings want to belong. I think we, we have that kind of instinct to belong, but then understanding that it's okay to belong and be unique. And, and we all, as you said, I love what you said, we, we all have our gifts, right, to give. And, and, and we can only bring that forth if, if our yeah, our selves, our self beliefs, our uh, self esteem is cultivated, and and without that, we're just gonna, I guess, join a group and then be part of, part of some kind of you know, separated group. But if if only, yeah, if only people understood how connected we really are, you know, beyond this world, the, I mean, this reality. Um, I guess it would be it would be a very very different world and and you know I, that's why you know I love Dr. Joe for example as as a teacher because he's he's helping you know people to realize and understand that separation is the illusion actually and um, and yeah just because we have different opinions it doesn't mean that you know we are say, we are we are still the same and and it's it can be so beautiful it can be way more beautiful than how ugly it is right now i really believe that and i really believe that you know we all chose including ourselves to be here right now to to be part of this this big change and and our voice is so important and um you know teaching the work for me is that's why it's so empowering because seeing transformation and being part of transformation is the most magical thing that will then, you know, inspire you to change more and you to, you know, strive to be greater. And that's how I think we will evolve. And sooner or later, the majority will have to also realize that that's the only way forward, you know, yeah you said something interesting at the start of this about when you were teaching people nutrition and they didn't effectively like follow through and they would slip back into bad habits Mm -hmm. but now Mm -hmm. that you have studied and that you are consultant of uh, joe dispenser's um you've learned actually how to teach people to effectively i'm assuming um keep good habits or I don't know what the word mm-hmm. was or change you, their old ones I guess change, mm-hmm. yeah so 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 how how do you do that how do you how do you help them come to that realization 
so I guess it's it's uh, what we what we were talking about become becoming conscious of you know of the old programs is is a is a big part of it because without knowing what you want to change you're not going to be able to change it and um that is the part that is not so easy and and that is the part that maybe not everybody's going to be willing uh to do because then you really have to you know look into the mirror and just go deep and it's not pretty you know to to realize and i think change is very uncomfortable um being in the unknown is very uncomfortable but i think the most uncomfortable thing is to realize that the things that you're judging in another person maybe personality traits or you know certain things they do you are actually doing them as well like for me that was for my personal experience that was the hardest and most uncomfortable one because you recognize certain emotions in others but the reason I guess you recognize them so easily because you've got them as well and if you are willing to go and dig deep um, then you find them and that's going to make you feel super uncomfortable but then obviously once you know you cannot not know and then one way to um, kind of transmute them is to observe yourself and you know once you're conscious of them, then you are more likely that you're going to be able to stop them as well. And then, okay, if I don't want to be this person, then who do I want to be? So it's that creation that, okay, I have to actually work on who I no longer want to be. And then I also have to work on who I do want to be. And that is, uh, we teach tools um, for for people uh, in this course that um, I teach as well, how to do that, super practical ones and very powerful ones as well. And I use them every single day. And um, yeah, I don't think it's ever going to end, but it's so nice to realize that, you know, oh my God, my old self would have done this in this moment and I'm not doing it you know so it's that those moments they can feel so so powerful because that's when you realize wow I changed so much and you know that's why it was funny to look back to my eight-year-old self or my 18-year-old self because it's not me um and I guess even three years ago I was a completely different person and I never want to stop this evolution because I think that's one of the reasons why we are here. And that's one of the reasons, as you said, we can have new experiences if we are willing to go for the next one and the next one and the next one and keep evolving ourselves with it. It's, it's just part of transformation and change. Yeah. You're right. It is difficult uh, for people to have that reflection of, uh, maybe why they are angry at somebody mm -hmm. or um, jealous even I think jealousy is like a huge one you know like if you yeah it was for me it was huge yeah if you really have to kind Envy, of like jealousy drill down into okay why am I jealous of this person and what they're doing you know like this guy oh mm -hmm. he's 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 talking now and he's on stages and stuff but I think he's a dick you know <laughs> but actually is he's I know. not a dick yeah. it's it's because I want to be doing what he's doing do you know what I mean? And 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 most people I like do know what you mean. <laughs> most people, like we've said, they don't want to drill down and actually go, oh, it's me here that's actually the dick, not him. <laughs> that's yeah. really fascinating. And I think, you know, realizing that we only we only judge others if we are judging ourselves. And, you know, I'm I'm always like, okay, if I think this about this person then where am I thinking that of myself? It's, I, I guess this is like that um, people, only human beings can, can do this, this observing ourselves in a, you know, with a third person, it's called metacognition in neuroscience. And it's so important for us to be able to do that because that is key in order for us to be able to shift our, you know, and change ourselves and change those habits hundred percent. Eddie, you work as a, I think it's called an NCS, NeuroChange Solutions Consultant. Solutions. Mm -hmm. 
what, uh, how, how do people maybe find out more about that? Because I, I think a lot of people would be interested to, you know, to possibly do it themselves. Sure. So um, uh, NeuroChange Solutions is, um, is Dr. Joe's company. And um, he's got now around 250 uh, NCS consultants including myself and we are all around the world and uh, so basically if you go to neurochangesolutions.com then uh, uh, you can uh, inquire and whoever is closest to you locally if you would like uh, in-person training we'll get in touch and uh, they can uh, have a strategic session with you and talk to you whether you want to just a uh, one-on-one -on -one or you're you know you want to bring uh, this work to your organization I mean to to observe and to be part of the the transformation that can happen within uh, companies for me this year was huge it was just it's just the most beautiful uh, thing to watch because it's also you know Dr. Joe's mission he always says is to change the world through changing individuals and being part of, you know, individual transformation, but companies are the same. They will only change if individuals change. It's not, it's never going to be a top down thing, is it? So imagine, for example, if the management team of a company understands this information and they learn to self-regulate and they learned to, um, stop or shorten their emotional reactions and they learn the difference between living in survival or creation or they learn how our three brains take us from thinking to doing to being they learn about metacognition and all these things and i guess um because of the age that we are in information and knowledge is so important and science is so important and that's why i'm doing this work because he explains everything with science and uh, he's got amazing uh, research results as well. So I think because it is scientific, it can be so powerful for any, you know, company as well. And he always jokes and says that, you know, when he started this work in the 90s, I think, he, you couldn't even say meditation because then, you know, they would think that, as you said, the hippie whatever curse or you know they would they would think that something's wrong with you and now meditation is actually quite popular and it's 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 a cool thing to do so so how different it is now to teach this work it's uh, he he called actually the meditation mental rehearsal to start with because that's how companies would only accept it and you know now you can actually talk about meditation and obviously then the brain waves and all those things that you know, we, we talked about as well. This this knowledge is so important. It, it should be, it should this should be taught in schools. I really believe it, you know. And one of my dreams, it's still, it's still there. I've written it down, is to to create a curriculum for for children that is based on this knowledge, you know, and that leads kids back to the polymath path and they understand, you know music and geometry and all those things which which were separated for us and which potentially created all the chaos that we are living in so I'm, I'm I'm like I wish I did this when I was 18 you know instead of now but it's never too late <laughs> yeah well you know with all the meditation you're doing you're kind of extending your your lifespan that's for sure so 100%. you know you you've you've got maybe you're a third third of the way through your life so you've got plenty of time still to to achieve all these things and I think that school curriculum would be an amazing thing definitely um it's really interesting that you you know there's only 250 people that are these consultants that's quite like an exclusive group of people so so well done for you know for being one of those people and and it's nice that thank you companies are more receptive to this kind of thing you know because I guess in in some people's minds still you know meditation and talking about uh, these things is is almost woo woo esoteric type of thing you I know. know like you have to go off to yeah. india and grow your hair long and and do these sort of things but um it's nice to hear that companies are actually wanting to integrate it into their their businesses and their organizations and 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 realizing the benefits of it you know because 
like you said, if you can calm people's kind of nervous systems, uh, if you can um, get them to kind of react better in in sort of uh, situations, to to have more clarity, to to think calmer, um, to to be creative, you know, to get into that creative think theta state. You said exactly. Then yeah. wow, their businesses are just gonna gonna thrive, you know. So the ones that are taking it on are gonna like go woo this way, you know, and the ones that aren't are gonna just totally 100%. get left behind. Yeah, I I I I so agree, and I I really feel that there is also a shift. You know, there's a shift of consciousness, and as a result of that, there's a shift shift for businesses as well. And and I think, as you said, conscious businesses will thrive, and the the push sales is kind of falling back because it's it's not it's not what people need anymore. And Oh, I could go so deep into this with like, you know, even talking about frequencies and all these things, but it's just not going to be the frequency, I guess that that's not going to be the vibe anymore. And people are not going to, I don't know, I, I, I never liked when something was pushed on me, but, um, but we can, we can actually work on, well, ourselves to become magnets of the things that we want by balancing our system. And then it's the, it's the same for a company as well a, a company also has has its own vibration and then it's so nice to like uh the company that i worked with on the weekend for example it's so nice to see that there is a company where the the ceos and the management team are actually interested in this work they are doing it but it's not only that they are doing it and you know that already impacts massively the whole company but now they also brought the management team to to learn this information so that they can also uh, work from this consciousness and then potentially moving it down to the production and uh, you know all the other uh, layers of the the organization as well but i know that already this and seeing you know how they arrived and then how they left uh, it was huge and that's why it's so fulfilling for me to to be there and to facilitate that because all I do is facilitate and remind people for of information that we all know deep inside, right? Um, and just bringing it all together for them through through this work and through, yeah, Dr. Joe's course, but it's so powerful to to watch people change and become you know a coherent group of people who are no longer frustrated but are actually able to see things as challenges as as a collective you know instead of 11 separate managers dealing with their own stuff being frustrated potentially and having way too much on and and then and another twist on it you know even the company's mission and vision and what they want and its health consciousness so it was it was so amazing I actually just did a an exercise and maybe this could be something that everybody can try and it's very powerful um I did a intention setting exercise with them but also for myself and that was to have the best my ideal my best NCS client and it and this company was literally that you know so it was interesting how straight after that it happened but you know you write you just write down what you don't want and then you write down about your focus what you do want and then you write down what feeling you will feel if if it happens and then everything that you don't want you cross over that's so key it's like the most important part and it's so satisfying as well to just cross those things out and then there you've got your intention and the emotions and then practice feeling those emotions during the day as many times as you as you can and see what magic happens because it's definitely going to it's it's inevitable yeah no oh, it's so cool um i feel like there's there's like a three-hour podcast that we will have to do in the future about the, the sort of <laughs> nitty-gritty of, of this sort of stuff because that's where you know, like a lot of people are going to just like go, wow, okay, cool. That's, this is what I, I kind of, I need in my life. Um, but, but I guess j just to kind of start wrapping things up a little bit, um, Eddie, what, um, what have you got sort of coming up and, uh, what are you kind of most excited about, um, for the future when it comes to, to yourself and what you're doing? Oh, so thank you for this question. It's so cool. I'm, I mean, it's the end of the year. So I, I think about it 
this a lot. And I had such an amazing last three years. I've been able to attend around 30 events with Dr. Joe Dispenza. I, I was able to volunteer on most of them. I became his consultant and I have been part of so many people's transformation, even at the events, you know, and to, to see that, to be able to part of that, to be able to be part of the the volunteer group, the organ, you know, the organization uh, of the events. It was amazing. I traveled to so 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 many places, and then for for the next year, I really want to bring this work to as many companies and to as many people as possible, so that I actually, you know, I I can be in a way the channel for those people who may may not be able to just go yet to to one of those events, but to to sow those seeds in people's minds that we are creators of our reality and and you know you don't need anything you've got everything in order for you to create anything you want you don't have to wait for you know a greater time or this kind of money to arrive you can actually create just with your human body by regulating your you know emotions etc and and yeah my 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 aspiration for 2024 is to just be in as many places and train as many people as I can. And so that I can, I can really transmit the message and then, yeah, get people started on their journey. Um, that's pretty much it. And then attend, you know, events again, uh, but not as many <laughs> because it was, it was, uh, it was quite extensive to be honest. And it was a privilege uh, and at the same time, you know, traveling almost, yeah, I think every month, more than every month, more than once every month, it was um, my, my poor body, my soul was flying and soaring, but my body sometimes was like, what are you doing? Um, so yeah, that's, that's what I'd like to create in 24. Thank sounds you for like asking. You, sounds like you've, uh, you need to put that into your, your meditation and, um, and, and start, 100%. Start it's that. already sure, in there. I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure it's there already. <laughs> um, yeah. And then, if people want to get hold of you or find out a little bit more about you, is that you have a website, um, social media, yeah. that sort of stuff? I do. I do. I have um, my website is called Waves of Wealth, but it's w e l l t h dot com. So I'm playing with wealth and being well. Uh, so that's my website site and you can find out about even the NCS training and I actually created a course when I was doing my first retreat um, in Mexico uh, it's all based on my experience of yoga breathwork meditation nutrition functional medicine and it's uh, building on the seven energy centers it's it's called the seven energy centers of highly effective people so that's that. And um, we also teach uh, heart math uh, to people. So Dr. Joe uh, works together with the Heart Math Institute. And so there's, a, there's another training course that I teach, which is um, uh, the science and practice of uh, uh, heart coherence. It's amazing. So that's also very practical tools that people can do, you know, and implement into their daily lives with eyes open, but just uh, to help with all that regulation as we were talking about. So all of those things you can find on my website. I've got uh, Instagram, my own uh, private, not private, but my own like personal one. It's Edit Chanaloshi. And uh, I've got my uh, Waves of Wealth one as well. I should post more. I started to play with that one, but I, I've been <laughs> I've been neglecting social media a little bit, to be honest, with all the travels. But um yeah, and then email also anywhere. Cool. That's really cool. Um yeah, I think uh yeah, you'll probably have quite a few people getting in touch. Um there's 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 so much that we like haven't even touched on, you know what I mean? We've just sort of um I know. over everything you know what i mean um but but it's a not a really nice taster um just my last question eddie is uh, what does yeah. being ridiculously human mean to you well ridiculously human you like you when you created this i i i really thought that 
you are ridiculously human so and then seeing all your all your um guests so far and i guess it's it's just to serve serve people and help people and to be there for as many people as possible and to be the greatest expression of who we can be and i guess to strive for that every single day and knowing that if maybe today it wasn't quite there there's another day tomorrow and i love that quote that if you want to figure out whether your mission on on this planet has ended or not if you're alive it hasn't so let's go <laughs> <laughs> ah that's a super cool quote thanks for thanks for sharing it a lot i like it a lot and so Eddie, I just wanted to just say like a massive thanks uh, for for coming on the show. Like like I said, we've only literally just sort of touched on things, um, you know. And uh, th there's there's so much now for people to go. Okay, cool. I need to go and find out a lot more. So so I think it's a it's a great like taster. But just when it comes to you, you know, like you you're such an inspiring lady. You know, like your whole story, what you've gone through your evolution, the the challenges that you faced and um, what you've done about those challenges. You know what I mean? Like you've actually gone, okay, cool. This is what life is is kind of throwing at me and it's happening to me for, for whatever reason. And I'm going to just sort of um, do my absolute best and I'm going to listen to to what's happening and I'm going to uh, make the most of life. And I think that is like such a, a great thing for other people to realize that that anything is possible. You have... Literally, I mean, you studied so many things, you know, you got a wealth of knowledge, uh, literally, like, you know, I remember chatting to you quite, quite a few years ago, because we, I was going to go do like a chef's course at the same, um, same uh, oh, CNM, yes. you know, and I was like, Oh, what's this place like? And because you, you were studying your, mm. your nutritional um, nutrition there. course mm -hmm. there and, and stuff. And, you know, and you've done lots of these things. Um, so, so your, your knowledge is deep, and it's wide as well. Um, and and especially now, I think it almost feels like you've rounded everything off now with the kind of uh, the Joe Dispenza work, and and this is going to allow you to sort of achieve everything that you want that you said next year. Um, so just thanks so much, and um, you know, thanks for your Thank you. your kind heartedness and your the, the the sort of peaceful energy that you hold, and just been really nice sort of chatting to you again and and connecting. Thank you so much. Same here. I really really appreciate it. It was so fun. Awesome. Thank you. Cool, Eddie.